guys, Mike, in Bell 556 here. And this is the new Wolf A1 Upper. This is just starting to hit the market now and has a suggested retail price of $600. This upper is essentially a Taiwanese Type 91 rifle. What Wolf has done is essentially import the parts kit for the upper receiver from Taiwan for their Type 91 rifle minus the barrel. And if you look, this is their owner's manual. It is one folded page. This is a very simple owner's manual because this is a very straightforward and foolproof design. On this page you have an exploded diagram of the parts and I think if you take a look at this, this is essentially the entire upper receiver but there's no barrel in this diagram. So what Wolf has done is take all of the parts as a parts kit if you will and then combine these with a new hammer forged US made barrel and put together this upper receiver. This is a piston driven short stroke upper receiver that is used by the Taiwanese military and has been adopted by a couple of small country militaries as well. All that comes in the box besides the upper receiver is this one little extra front sight post and then the owner's manual. Just take a close look on the muzzle we have what amounts to an extended A2 style flash hider. They do use a locking nut rather than a crush washer to index and secure the, the muzzle device. The barrel is a USA made hammer forged melanite treated barrel. The front gas block is just built like a tank. It is solid and it has several functions. In the very front, you have the retainer for the entire gas piston unit that comes out in one piece. We'll see that when we disassemble the gun. And this ring is the release for the gas piston system. It is under spring tension and has two detents 180 degrees from each other. So this is the removal mode and that's the retention mode. You have two threaded areas on the top of the handguard if you wanted to add accessories. The bottom has this fairly aggressive grip. It's insulated. On the front of the receiver, on the top of the rail, you see this little metal tab. And that appears to be just a, a reinforcement of steel for the op rod of the piston system. Otherwise, the uh, receiver on the left side looks pretty much like a standard AR-15 A2 receiver. However, this is an A1, and you'll see why. When we go to the other side of the receiver, the charging handle looks like a, a basic charging handle. But when we go over to the right side of the receiver, you'll notice there are a couple of things missing here from your typical A2. The forward assist is completely gone. This is a slick side, if you will and the large brass deflector has been muted to this very little rim here. They still call this a brass deflector. Let's field strip and look at the internal parts of this upper now. I'd like to go ahead and take the hand guard off first so that you can see the position of this unit that is a self-contained piston drive system. So we'll take the pin and drive it out from the left side. Once this is all the way out, the hand guards just completely separate. You can see the aluminum insulation on the inside. Then the top hand guard just lifts off. And this is what I wanted to, to show you. This piston drive system is held in position as a unit with all of the parts contained inside. We'll go ahead and take the charging handle and bolt carrier out. The charging handle looks pretty much like any standard AR-15 M16 charging handle. The bolt carrier has the one-piece striker face Disassembly is like any other AR-15, M16 um, 
bolt carrier disassembly you're used to. You have the little cotter key here. Take that out. That looks completely standard. Now, tap on it. The firing pin. The, the literature doesn't say exactly what kind of firing pin coating they use. I don't know if this is a melanite treated firing pin. It obviously is dark in color. It's not hard chrome plated. But if you take this pin compared to the M16 pin, you can see side by side. I looked at all the critical measurements and it appears that these firing pins would be interchangeable. The cam pin looks uh, pretty standard, although look how oblong the opening is for the firing pin. And if you compare this side by side, I started looking through my cam pins and um, found that there is actually a little bit of variation. None of the cam pins are as oval as this Type 91. I think that the replacement parts for an AR-15 would work to replace this cam pin. The bolt itself looks very familiar as far as the front of the bolt, the locking lugs, the ejector and extractor. All of these parts look interchangeable with an AR-15. However, if you look at the very back of the bolt where the gas rings would normally be, you have a nice flat machined surface. So th this flat surface is going to interact very well with the cylinder part of the bolt carrier. But once again, I think in a crunch, if you had to, um, an AR-15 bolt would work fine with this system. The bolt carrier appears to be parkerized, and I cannot appreciate any hard chroming inside the bolt carrier. This is the heart of the design of this Type 91 rifle to make this a short stroke piston-driven AR-15 type of weapon. Now for those who would criticize the piston as not being appropriate for an AR-15, I'll refer you to the Navy SEALs, the HK-416, the Marine Corps now with their M27. Research that a little bit if you don't think that pistons have any place in an AR-15 designed rifle. So, once again, this, uh, the instructions in the owner's manual are very straightforward and simple. This is really designed to be a completely intuitive and foolproof design. Even though inside this sleeve, there are going to be several parts, they're only going to go one way. This is reminiscent of um, a, a tubular magazine on a 22 rifle. Release the tension, rotate, and then everything is released. So once we've done that, then we're going to pull this outer sleeve off. I'm going to try to leave this so that everything stays in its original position for our first look. Okay, so this sleeve just contains all of the parts of the piston drive system. And here they are. So on the back we have a, a collar. This collar is cut flat. This goes over the barrel nut. Then the second, we have this nice heavy flat spring. Then third, we have a collar. Now notice all of these parts are the same on both sides. That you cannot install this incorrectly. There is no front and back. And also notice the diameter of these parts changes. So if you take the diameter of the spring and the diameter of this collar, they're very different. The op rod has varying diameters that will prevent you from installing things incorrectly. Then you have the lighter spring in the front. Also, one thing I found very interesting is this is a jointed op rod. And if any of you have any experience with the Colt piston system, they made a really big deal out of having a jointed op rod that would decrease stresses in the system. 
Then we're going to pull. This is where the gas is going to come from the barrel and enter the system. That is your cylinder, if you will. And here is your gas piston. Interesting design. Three rings that are permanently machined into the metal itself. You don't have little gas rings that, that could be replaced. You have your, your exhaust ports. So when the gas piston comes past this point, the excess pressure is exhausted. Once again, this is, this is now all broken down. Those are all the parts. And it's very intuitive. It's also very oily from the factory. Now this is a, generally speaking, you don't like a lot of oil right where your gas is coming out. So we'll, we'll wipe a little bit of this excess oil off of this part before we go out and shoot this rifle. So I'm just gonna wipe off the excess oil along the cylinder and piston parts. Obviously with the springs and op rod, we want to leave all the lubrication on them we can. So, uh, once again, assembly, just very simple and straightforward. The op rod spins around freely. And then when we go to put everything together, you can't put it on wrong. The long spring goes on first. The collar, the heavier spring, And then the slotted collar that's going to keep everything oriented over the barrel nut. All of these parts are then held in position and retained by this outer sleeve. And it just makes this whole system one unit. Held in position with spring tension. And it's ready to just slide in as a unit back into the rifle. When you do that, we're going to just put this through the front. The flat collar, the flat part of the collar is going to need to be down when we install it. Once it's fully installed, then you just rotate the sleeve around so that the collar locks it in position with the gas lock. When you install this, now the hand guards are, if the hand guards were in place, you wouldn't be able to see this. So let me just show you. When you go to install it, you, you have to, you have to get the collar, this collar lined up properly. So it will keep it oriented. And so when you go to put it in, if it's, it's hitting and not going in, you just rotate everything around until the flat surface interacts with the barrel nut. So once this is oriented, then in the front of the gun, you just take the locking sleeve, flat surface down, be a little bit of spring tension. So you push it in and twist the collar to lock it. You go 180 degrees so that the flat side is up. This has got to be right at 180 degrees before you can rotate this. Once you, if it's a little bit out of a line, this isn't going to push in all the way. Once this is lined up properly, you just push it in, twist it, and that will prevent this from rotating now. And this is in a, its own detent. Now all we have to do is just uh, reverse order to install the hand guards, put the bolt carrying charger handle back in. Okay, everything's back together now. Now one question I have is how are we going to do if we take just a standard A2 handle with the sights on the rear. For our testing purposes, we're just going to start with this. We'll keep it simple. I didn't know if that metal up front on this receiver was going to interfere with this somehow, but it looks like it goes on fine. You can see up front, there's the pin for that little metal reinforcement. It looks secure. So I think this will work fine for our testing purposes now. We'll put this up for now on a semi-automatic and a registered full auto lower and test this out in the field. We're going to start out just testing this in semi-auto. I've got one round in the mag. This is Lake City 55 grain ammo ball. And let's just confirm we have adequate gas pressure. <laughs> Held open. Now let's try some weaker steel-cased Wolf. One round in the mag with 223 Wolf now. 
We have a standard weight carbine buffer, standard weight carbine spring. Bolt held back. So this upper on the semi-automatic lower has enough gas to drive this system appropriately, both with standard 55 grain ball from Lake City and the weaker 223 from Wolf Ammunition. It's with a standard carbine buffer spring and standard carbine buffer weight. Let's try a magazine full of Lake City now. Okay, let's try the Wolf. Let's see how it runs with Wolf now. It's very smooth. It cycles very well. It doesn't seem to be as harsh as a lot of piston systems in AR-15 platform. Not enough power, just not getting back in full auto. We have this heavy green spring. Let me lighten up the spring and see if that makes a difference. Seems to be doing good. Wow. <laughs> that was very smooth. I don't know if you noticed, but the muzzle didn't seem to be moving at all. It was a very slow fire rate. I'd say maybe around 550 even or 600, but that was very, very controllable and smooth. I I've got to try that again. We're going to try a different angle so you can see just how steady this rifle is now with Wolf ammunition. Guys, this tells you something about how well tuned a rifle system is. There's all the casings from 60 rounds, all in one fairly tight little area.
right now, but it's all in the name of science. I can tell you the barrel is really hot. The bottom of this handguard is barely warm, so it's doing a good job insulating the heat. Beautiful. Well, in my full auto test, my registered receiver is running with the extended A5 buffer tube. And on top of that, I have the heavier buffer and the heavier green spring from Spring Co. When I tried the Wolf Ammunition, I just had to go down to a standard rifle spring and a 5.3 ounce buffer rather than the 6.1 ounce buffer. When I did that, then this upper runs beautifully in full auto with the weaker powered Wolf Ammunition. And interestingly, I haven't had one dud yet using this Wolf Ammunition, which has had several duds in other upper receivers I've tried over the past month. We have about 300 rounds through it now. Let's just check the bolt. Well, if you can appreciate it, it's not particularly dirty. Still has lube on it. One thing I forgot to mention, um, when I was reviewing this in the shop, this does have these uh, sand cuts, they're called, on the contact surfaces of the bolt carrier. These sand cuts just help with reliability when the weapon becomes dirty. Inside the receiver itself doesn't look that bad. There again, you can see, uh, hopefully you can appreciate on the, the piston rod itself, there's still considerable amount of lubrication still present. So what's my final assessment of this Wolf A1 upper, which is in fact a Type 91 rifle from the Republic of China or Taiwan? If you're one of those guys that feels like a piston system really doesn't have any business in an AR-15 platform, then this might be the upper to change your mind. And at the $600 price tag, even in today's market, which is really a good buyer's market for AR-15 products, $600 for this upper is a bargain. This is a purpose-built short-stroke piston system for the AR-15 type rifle. If you're already a guy that likes pistons in AR-15s because they're cleaner and cooler, then at $600, this is a must-have accessory for your AR-15. It's built like a tank. It's smooth running. It's been 100% dependable. The only real difference between this upper receiver and the Type 91 that's used by the Republic of China is that this upper from Wolf comes with a U.S. hammer-forged melanite-treated barrel. And that's not all bad. If you have any questions or comments, please post them. And as always, I'll try to respond to those in a timely fashion. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.